third lesson on baptism, we're talking about an overview of how baptism runs like a thread from the very first part of the New Testament to the end. We see baptism start when God had, by the prophet Isaiah, prophesied that a man would come and prepare the way for Jesus. And this man's name was John. And what he did to prepare the way for Jesus was that he told people to repent and be baptized. And he baptized so many that he was called John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. And we see that Christ, when he became, began his ministry, he thought it important to go to John the Baptist and be baptized. John the Baptist says, you don't need to be baptized, you have no sin. He didn't say he had no sin, but he knew that Jesus had no sin. But Jesus said, let's fulfill all righteousness, suffer it to be so. Fulfill all righteousness, doing God's will. And God showed his approval of Jesus' baptism by opening the sky and the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove. And the voice of the Lord said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we know that a little later, John the Baptist would claim that God told him to come and baptize in John 3. This was not something that he thought up. In John 4, 1, we find out that Jesus' disciples baptized more people than John did. We see that Jesus said, you must be born again. And then at the end, he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That was the first lesson of the overview of baptism. This, this 30,000 foot view. This next lesson, we talked about how the apostles responded to those examples and commands. That Peter preached that first gospel sermon and said, repent and be baptized. That every conversion in the book of Acts ended in baptism. That there were thousands baptized, 3,000 at a time, 5,000 at a time. That this was God's plan. Now, I want to go to the epistles, to the, to the last part of the New Testament. Now, these epistles are letters written to churches. Now, there's some to individuals, but we're going to talk about some of the letters written to churches. And we're going to see what the apostles wrote about baptism. Remember that the apostles were writing to church members, and as church members, these people were baptized. To give you an idea of what Paul thought about the people that he was writing to, Romans 1, 7 says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. This is important that we know that these people were beloved of God and called to be saints. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, they're set apart. They're sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Galatians 1, 2, perhaps Galatians, the ones who were going the farthest away the quickest, and yet Paul addresses them to the churches of Galatia. In these letters, the, the apostle seems to assume that these people are baptized. And we'll see that in these examples that I've picked out to show how the apostles wrote about baptism. Now, one thing that, that it seems, it seems that they thought baptism was foundational, that baptism was understood by all. And that's illustrated in Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, elementary principles, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation, foundation, so these are elementary principles, foundation of repentance, of faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These are things which are foundational, which are the beginnings, the elementary principles of Christianity, 
repentance, faith, baptism, resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment. Those are all things that we know are the foundation of Christianity. And the writer of Hebrews says we're going to go on to perfection. We're, we've got this. Now we want to go on towards sanctification, towards becoming the servant that God wants us to be. So in terms of that, we see that baptism, there's not a letter in the New Testament that is devoted to explaining baptism. When you see baptism mentioned in the epistles, it's normally mentioned as a way to explain the argument that Paul is making. Paul is going to make arguments and we're going to see that one of the ways he does is he appeals to baptism thinking that these people he's talking to already know about baptism. And he's going to use this to make his point. The first one I want to talk about is in Colossians. Now, remember that, that there are three rules of interpretation of the Scripture. Those three rules are context, context, and context. So let's see what is the context of Colossians. Paul wrote this book to the, the people at Colossae to say, don't be fooled by these teachers that are coming and telling you you need special knowledge, that you need more than Christ. Or some were claiming that Christ was just a spirit. He wasn't a real man. Others were saying Christ was just a man and the Spirit of God came upon him at his baptism and left him at his crucifixion. This is the beginning of the movement that we will later see as Gnosticism. But the theme of Colossians is found in Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him, that is Jesus, for in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's number one. In Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And verse 10, and you are complete in him. Jesus, in him dwells all the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. And that is going completely against what these false teachers are teaching, saying that you need special knowledge because this man Jesus is not who you think he is. This is the argument of the book of Colossians. The next verse, Colossians 2, 11. Paul wants his people that he's writing to to know that they have received from God spiritual circumcision. Let's read Colossians 2, verse 11 through 14. <clears throat> In him, that is in Jesus, in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision in Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised in him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, that is Jesus, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. <clears throat> Remember, circumcision was given as a symbol and a seal of being one of God's people. It was given to Abraham before the giving of the law. And for us to understand our spiritual circumcision, we need to look back and see what was this physical circumcision. Because we are promised that Christ has circumcised us through baptism. When we were buried and in him we were raised. The dead works of the flesh were cut off from us. And now we are children of God. Let's look back in Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17 is when God instituted circumcision. 
This was, we'll find out later, 430 years before the giving of the law. Genesis 17, verse 9. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your seed after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and your descendants. Every male child, get that, every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it will be a sign of the covenant, a sign of the covenant between me and you. Let's skip down to verse 13. Excuse me, verse 12. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house, bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God was serious about circumcision. Let's see how Abraham answered this command, this covenant. Verse 23, Abraham took his son Ishmael, and all the slaves born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. Abraham was 99 years old when he circumcised, was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Verse 26, that very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. Now you remember Abraham, Abraham was an amazing man. He was told later on to, to sacrifice his only son. If you remember, it says he got up early in the morning. There was no hesitation with Abraham. When he got God's command that he must be circumcised, all the slaves in his house must be circumcised, his son must be circumcised that very day. God is serious about circumcision. We see that again in Moses, Exodus 4. Exodus 3, God calls Moses to be his prophet. But on the way home, it says God sought to kill Moses because his sons were not circumcised. And so Moses had to have his sons circumcised. Because God is serious. God is serious about circumcision. It's the sign and the seal between man and God. It is obedience to God's covenant. And Paul tells us in Colossians 2, baptism is the spiritual circumcision. The sign that we belong to God. The sins of our flesh have been cut off. We bear a symbol, a sign. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So this baptism is used to show the Colossians that they don't need anything more than Christ. They can refute these false teachers. The second time that I want to look at that baptism is mentioned is in the book of Galatians. And, and the context of Galatians, the Galatians were listening to the Judaizing teachers who said, you've got to do the old law. You've got to keep the feasts. You've got to keep all these things in the old law. You've got to keep the Sabbath. And Paul writes an entire book to them to say, oh, foolish Galatians, why have you left? This is the context that Paul is going to bring about where he talks about baptism. We're going to go to the third chapter of Galatians. We've talked about this covenant of circumcision, and we're going to go back to that again. Paul is going to bring this up in the third chapter, verse 15. 
Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Paul's saying even a man's contract between two people, nobody cancels it or adds to it. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. That's just what we read. Genesis 17. He says to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say to seeds as to many, but as to one and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul, it cannot make void, the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, that it should be a promise of no effect. For if, for if inheritance is from the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to him by promise. Skip to verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, If God could have given a law that could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture is confined all under sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. Kept for the faith which would afterwards be revealed. Therefore, the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Paul is saying that the promise that we have is from Abraham. Abraham was promised you and your seed, which is Christ. We know that because God told Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He's talking about Christ. And Paul is telling the Galatians the law was temporary. It was to bring you to Christ. It was a tutor. It's an interesting word. It's a guard. It is a slave that is assigned to rich children to guard them physically, to keep them within the bounds of where the master wants his children kept, and to take them to school. It's a special type of guard, and they are they are given the responsibility of the safety of the children. And this is the type of guard that the law was to the Jews to bring them to Jesus. Verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The argument Paul is making is you you Galatians don't need to follow the law. You've got something better. You have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had the covenant with Abraham before the law and that is what we're looking at you are covered with Christ when you were baptized you went into Christ some translations say you were clothed in Christ you don't need the law because you are sons of promise you are heirs along with Jesus so you see he's using baptism something they know about We know that Paul assumed all were baptized, for he said, for as many of you as were baptized, that's the same language you would use to any club, to any uh, team, you know, for as many of you as are out here doing this, for any military group, that's that's a, a rhetorical statement that says all of us. It says, for as many of you as were baptized have put on Christ. Verse 26, it says you're all sons. And that's an interesting point. That is a masculine term. The the term for children is tekna. 
And tekna is used in that, like in First uh, John three one. See what manner of love the God that God has showered upon us that we should be called children of God. That's children, tekna. But this word is huoi, and it's sons. It is specifically male. And what this is telling people, you remember in the first century and, and before and for many centuries after, women could not inherit anything. Women were property. Women were second-class citizens. Paul tells all of them, you're all sons. And you're all going to inherit through Jesus Christ back to the original covenant God made with Abraham and his seed who was Christ. So we see baptism is where we put on Christ. We come into Christ. It is a passing point of many points that Paul has that Galatians, you don't need to follow the Old Testament you have something better. Not, you are no longer slaves to the law. You are sons of promise. You are inheritors with Jesus Christ. You are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we see this over and over in the, in the New Testament. Baptism is, is not taken as a subject for one of the letters. It's used when it needs to be used because Paul knew that these people knew baptism, they had experienced baptism, and baptism was used as one of the points in his arguments. This is important for us to know as Christians. For there are those in this, in this world, in, in Christianity as it were, saying we don't need to be baptized. And yet we see that baptism was so common, common's not a good word, so widespread that the writer of Hebrews says it's foundational, it's elementary. We've got this down so we're going to move on toward perfection. And then Paul uses it as points in his not even stopping to explain baptism as such, but using it as points to say, you're circumcised with spiritual circumcision. You don't need anybody else but Christ, what he says in Colossians. And he says, you are heirs with Christ through baptism, so you don't need to keep the old law anymore. One more time that I want to talk, look at where baptism is mentioned in passing is in 1 Corinthians 1. Paul is writing to correct some things in the church at Corinth. And before we go any farther, I'd like to talk about the church in Corinth for just a little while. Sometimes we talk bad about these people. How could they have so many problems? How could they be so divided? How could they be so ignorant of the things that God has given them? But brethren, we need to understand that number one, these are beloved of God. These are God's children, sanctified in Jesus Christ. And we are doing a great disservice to talk bad about them and to judge them. Remember, they had no written New Testament like we have. They, have no, they had no culture. We have hundreds of years, about thousands of years of Christianity that has percolated down to us and Christian families. These people came out, of, they came out of idolatry. They came out of sinfulness that we can only imagine and turned to God. And in a few years, many of these people will be martyrs. So let's not talk bad about them because they had some bumps when they were moving in from idolatry to Christianity. 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 10. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all 
be in agreement. And there be no divisions among you, but that you be united with the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or are you baptized in the name of Paul? He asked these rhetorical questions, which they can only answer no. He says, has Christ been divided? No, they, they can only answer no. Was Paul crucified for you? They say no. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? They say no. And of course, this is assuming, once again, Paul assumes they've been baptized or he wouldn't use this. He assumes they've been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as Christ had commanded. He's fighting against division. This is the context. And we have to know the context because the next verse is quite shocking. Verse 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you. That is where many denominational preachers stop. And they say, see, this proves Paul was against baptism. They pull it completely out of context. But let's read the whole thing. It says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And what was the reason? What was the reason that Paul was thankful that he baptized none except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say I baptized in my own name that's the reason he was thankful to God he didn't want an opportunity to arise to cause more division Paul was persecuted by Judaizing teachers he was persecuted by other preachers that were jealous of him People talked bad about him, and he was thankful that he didn't baptize a whole bunch of the Corinthians <coughs> so that they would not be further divided. Verse 16. Verse 16 is a parenthetical statement. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. This is an important verse. It's important because you can imagine Paul is dictating this letter to a scribe who's writing. <clears throat> and Paul's saying, I'm glad I didn't baptize anyone except Crispus and Gaius. Now, first of all, you know Paul must have approved of baptism if he baptized Crispus and Gaius. But he says that and uh, that, that no one can say anyone was baptized in my name. And then he stops. He says, oh, yeah, I, I also baptized the family of Stephanus. And, and uh, some others I can't remember. What does that tell you? <clears throat> Paul baptized a lot of people. He can't remember. He didn't have dementia. He didn't have Alzheimer's. He baptized a lot of people. And when he says, he's trying to be truthful here, he's dictating this letter. He says, oh, oh, yeah, I, I also baptized... Stephanus and his family. <clears throat> so we see that Paul regularly baptized people. But the reason he says this in the context, in the context was we're trying to dampen these divisions. We don't want anyone to say that I, Paul, baptized in my own name. This was, remember, this was we. We think the reason that Jesus baptized no one by his own hand so that no one could say, oh, Jesus' hands touched me. Or someone would say, oh, he's a superior teacher because Jesus himself baptized him. Jesus didn't baptize anyone. Then verse 17, a proof text. This is a proof text of those who say we don't need to be baptized. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel. And not with eloquent wisdom, 
so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of his power. He says that Christ did not send him to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And people say, oh, well, Paul didn't believe in baptism. That's why he said Christ didn't send him to baptize. That he was a different type of preacher to the, to the Gentiles instead of the Jews. But we see that Paul baptized regularly. That can't be the correct interpretation of this. What would, what would cause Paul to say, Jesus didn't send me to baptize, but he sent me to preach the gospel? Well, let's take an example. My father was in the grocery business. He did well in the grocery business. He became a manager. And the chain of grocery stores he was a manager of, we lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time, they would send him to other stores to take over these stores for between two and six months. And he was, in his own words, he was the alligator. He would go in and he would clean up. He would fix the problems that were in that store. So let's say that he went into that store and, and he's talking to his assistant manager and the assistant manager says, well, if you really want to help us fix this store, you know, we need to stock this shelf. And my father could have easily answered, I was not here to sent, I was not sent here to stock shelves. I was sent here to fix the store. It's sort of that way with Paul. Paul is saying, I'm sent here to fix this church. I'm, I'm writing this to fix this church. Or I, was, I came to you to fix these problems and to preach to people. Because it doesn't matter so much who you are baptized by. Any good man of the church can baptize you. Paul is talking about I have something more to do Baptism can be handled by others. And we see that Acts chapter 4. You remember the elders said it's not fitting for us to wait tables. They were taking care of the people that needed food. They said we need to pray more. And so they assigned men, we call deacons now, to take that load off of them. This is the same type of thing that Paul is saying. I was not sent to baptize but to preach the gospel. He has a mission. He has a special duty. Others can baptize. It's not a proof that Paul disapproved of baptism because of that parenthetical statement. We see in that parenthetical statement, oh yes, I also baptized the family of Stephanus and the others, I'm not sure how many more. We see that Paul baptized a lot of people. So we see that the apostles in these letters used baptism as a way to prove their text, as a way to prove their arguments. First of all, we saw that the argument was Christ is the fullness of God in bodily form and that's all you need. And in that argument, Paul says, we are circumcised through baptism. And in the second argument we looked at, Paul says to the Galatians, you don't need to keep the Old Testament law. Don't go back to that. Don't leave that which is good to go back to the law. He says, you were baptized into Christ. You are an heir with Christ. And then we see Paul saying to the Corinthians, don't be divided. Be the same. Be the same. And he's saying, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you so that none of you would say that I baptized in my own name and cause further division. So we can see in this last installment series here, the third that baptism has run through the New Testament. And at first, it was from the very first, John the Baptist. Jesus thought it was so important that he went to be baptized. He commanded that when his disciples went out and made 
disciples that they baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. These are the words of Jesus. And the apostles in Acts responded and baptized thousands of people. And in here, in these letters to the churches, we see that Paul, in his language, he assumes that they're all baptized, that baptism is common. Baptism is everywhere and easily understood and used as an example to prove his other points moving toward sanctification. This morning, I want to give a special blessing to those who are watching from home. If you've never been baptized, read again the scriptures. See again Christ's commandments. But those of you and those of us that are watching, we are all God's family. God will bless us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord's face shine upon you. We're going to sing.